Welcome to UC Today with me, David Dungay. Today, I'm going to be talking to Zias Caravalla from ZK Research to talk about the disruption in the UCAS market right now. So, without further ado, welcome, Zias. How are you doing? Yeah, great, Dave. Thanks. And this is a, it's a good topic. You know, we, the UCAS market kind of rolled along in a steady state for a long time. Then COVID came and all of a sudden we saw a tremendous amount of innovation. So that's it's been good for the industry, actually. Absolutely has. Well, for our viewers who might not know who you are, um, do you want to give us a, just a 30 second rundown of uh, yourself and uh, your business? Sure. So I'm the founder and principal analyst of my own research firm, ZK Research, as, as you mentioned. I've been doing that about uh, let's see, 10 years. Uh, before that, I was the chief research officer at Yankee Group. I was there about a decade. And actually, prior to that, I was actually on the IT side. So I was a, a CIO for a while. I worked for a VAR. Uh, I actually, it's you know, funny. So I actually tried doing voiceover frame frame relay in 1996, I think, uh, before the before VoIP was actually a thing. We were still doing it at layer two, and uh, I, I I like to joke that I was so successful with it that I had to leave the company. So we spent a lot of money. <laughs> then the technology evolved pretty quickly. So as a as an analyst, though, I cover a lot of different areas from networking to security and communications, but I really only focus on the areas that are in transition, right? So uh, once a market reaches a certain steady state and the value from the analyst becomes, you know, how many widgets did you sell? There's a lot of firms, IDC, Synergy, Delora, they do a great job of that. I try and stay, you know, at the front edge of the market, look at these disruptive areas. Yeah, well, um, you know, one of those disruptive areas, UCAS, you know, um, Unified Communications as a Service, we're seeing a lot of in innovation in this space, a lot of disruption. And of course, we've got the new, added dynamic of um, w workers getting back into uh, offices now. So, I mean, wh what, you, what are you seeing on uh, in the UCAS space uh, with regards to you know, people getting back to work? Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting that you bring up that UCAS is a fairly mature market, right? We've been talking about UCAS for almost 20 years. And for, it, for a 20-year-old market to be disruptive itself is kind of interesting. And what's driven that, I think, is that it, it was a lot of the, the, the work from home. And so when you think about the role of UCAS was historically, um, especially this type of interface, right, the meeting side, was to help a lot of professional people that work remotely, communicate with other people, things like that. So you only had a small percentage of the, the workforce using it. Today, everyone's using it, right? And so if you think of the, your typical worker, not everyone's tech savvy. There's a lot of older workers, there's a lot of people that aren't very technically savvy, there's people with low speed, you know, uh, internet connections. And so these, these platforms had to evolve very quickly in order to, to meet the needs of this much bigger demographic than we had before. Now, you asked the question about return to work. There's a lot of questions around, are we still going to use UCAS once we go back to the office, right? So now we're meeting in physical rooms. And I think, um, uh, I, I do think so. I think there's been enough innovation driven to these platforms and there's more coming that actually make meetings better, whether you're physical, virtual, or hybrid. And I found myself doing that the other day, you know, using a, a subset of it. I, I met with a company down in Silicon Valley. It was a little startup, right? But I actually went down to their offices and I went through the whole protocol, don't worry. Uh, and um, uh, I found myself turning on one of these UCAS tools and turning on the transcription engine because I wanted to capture the meeting notes, but I didn't want to have to take notes because we were whiteboard and I was talking to this, this, you know, the CEO and the founder and things like that. So. You can see that little feature alone, the ability to transcribe these meetings and record them is a big value add for meetings. And so as we start to add, you know, Cisco's trying to add people insights in and you see, you know, Microsoft with a lot of their, you know, uh, the, you know, Viva and things like that. There's a lot of things coming that will help us conduct meetings better, whether they're physical or virtual. And so I think the infusion of AI has made these things easier to use, but it's also uh, allowed us to conduct better meetings, physical or virtual. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really important point. Um, you know, one of the key themes we're seeing is, uh, a, a, I guess, a need or a want of businesses to really try and avoid, uh, you know, a silo in, in, in the business. When it comes to collaboration across home workers or remote workers uh, and people in the office, um, I mean, how important are these tools going to be to, I guess, avoiding that situation and making everyone, um, you know, productive across the board? Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting question because historically when you work remotely you were never quite as productive as when you're in the office right and then there were other certain moments in a day where you're waiting for a cab or you're on an airplane or you're in the airport waiting for your flight things like that 
where you were much less productive than you were when you were in the office. So if you if you think of the benchmark being in the office productivity, these tools are now built in a way that whether you're mobile, whether you're at home, whatever, you can be as productive, uh, in, you know, in the office, under the office, um, you know, run between appointments as, as you are in the office. And I think that's been a great uplift from a productivity standpoint. Now we don't, we're not limited by the things we can do. We can have high quality videos on our mobile device. You know, we can use our laptops. Even uh, I did a, uh, I did a Zoom call the other day from an airplane uh, and it wasn't great, but it worked okay. It was a little bit glitchy, but I could still participate in stuff. I don't think you're supposed to do that actually, but, uh, but I, but I did anyways, but, uh, but I, but I do think these, uh, these tools have gotten to the point where they, they do enable us to be as productive as we are in the office, regardless of where we are. Yeah. I, I want to delve into, um, AI, artificial intelligence a little bit there. Um, you know, what, what exactly are you seeing? You mentioned the transcription services, you know, where, where else is AI having, uh, an, an impact within the UCAS space right now? And, you know, what, what should people be aware of? Yeah, I, I think we have just started scratching the surface on the impact that AI is going to have. If uh, you were, um, uh, you know, to think of this as a, you know, a marathon, we're at mile one, right? So we've got a long runway to go. Uh, I think one of the, the interesting aspects of what AI is going to bring is we do, uh, you know, the in-meeting experience pretty well there. What we don't do very well in businesses is the pre and post meeting experience, right? So if everybody, I think everyone's worked at a company where you have that one super A type person that's diligently taking notes and they send emails to everybody and they make sure everybody's prepared for every meeting. Not everybody has that person, right? And so, but AI can be that. AI is always listening. They're always you know, recording all your data. And so you think of even the, the aspect of a transcription. Right. Well, it's great that I can transcribe the whole meeting, but I still need to go through it later. What if an AI engine can actually pull out the relevant points and send me meeting notes? Right. So now I don't have to review the entire meeting. Right. What if on this call I say to you, hey, Dave, I'll send you my PowerPoint by Friday. Well, why can't an AI engine go in and pop into my calendar on Friday morning and save Dave, send Dave PowerPoint? Right. So now all of a sudden these virtual agents and things we're building, and, you know, in the the ability to do video analysis and things like that can help us greatly with pre and post meeting experience. I, I think an, another, you know, element that's coming that because we've done a lot in voice analytics, right? But we haven't really started doing video. Uh, there's been a few announcements. Um, Unifor uh, bought a company, uh, Motion Research Labs. Google's uh, announced some stuff with Google Classroom where they can actually look at video and measure the engagement of people. So if you think of like a 10 person meeting, right, where everyone's virtual, you've always got the two people that are, you know, they're sitting like this or checking their email. Well, what if a, a virtual bot can inform the speaker that these two people haven't been engaged for four minutes? Well, you could then call that person out and say, hey, Dave, what do you think of that point that I just said, right? So that makes sure everybody stays engaged. And so I think the ability to look at emotion, engagement levels, things like that, make meetings better. And especially for things like virtual education and things where, because I don't think that's worked very well, but, but even in corporate meetings, um, you, you know, it's it's sometimes hard in a physical meeting to see if everyone's paying attention. Uh, but uh, so uh, I, I think in you know these tools can actually help speakers, moderators, uh, things like that. So there's lots and lots of stuff coming that'll I think will help us not just in meeting but pre and post as well. Yeah. Well, um, you know, mutual friend of ours, uh, Mr. Dave Michaels. Uh, you know, he talks a lot about how uh, intrusive uh, you know some of these disruptive technologies can become you know do you, do you find that do you, i mean do you feel that might be an issue with uh, with ai you know that they can really delve into what we're doing every second every minute you know have you moved your mouse cursor in the last 30 seconds you know that sort of thing I, 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 do you feel that might be an issue yeah i'm actually uh, looking forward to the uh, the emotion detection on dave so Nobody <laughs> <laughs> knows him. He's a, a little bit of a curmudgeon sometimes, but I, I think, um, I do think, you know, the answer is yes and no. I, I think people will raise the privacy issue and things like that until it makes their life easier. We, yeah. we like things that makes our, our lives easier. You think of like the, you know, things like airline pre-check programs and stuff. You know, we're all about. I want to keep my data private. Oh, until I can skip the airport line, then here have all my data. Right. So uh, it's, even with younger workers and things like that, you, you you think of like an app like Venmo, where we put in who we pay and what we're paying them for. We share that to our entire social community. So I think with a lot of the older generation, privacy was a much bigger issue with the younger ones. I think, um, again, the, the more 
these tools can use this data to make us more productive and make our lives easier, I think we're willing to look the other way on some of those things. I, I do think at a country level, countries like Germany and things like that, that have very, very tight privacy laws might have some issues with it. I think a lot of other, you know, the US seems to be pretty lax in that a lot of times. The same the UK somewhere in the middle, I suppose. Um, but I think country by country, this thing will, uh, these will um, uh, be played out. But, but clearly, you know, employers should be able, you know, on the, on the, on the positive side, and if an employer can tell people that use this app, this app, this app, and this app are 30% more productive than people that don't, well, that's a good thing, right? Then you can do some more training, you can help people, you know, stay engaged better and stuff. But there is the, you know, do you really want your boss knowing that your mouse was inactive for six minutes, right? Or something like that. So, uh, but I think as long as it's used properly, it'll make our lives better and people look really bad. Okay. Well, one area I really wanted to uh, talk to you about was actually uh, VR. Um, you know, is the world yeah. of UCAS ready for VR yet? W what are you seeing out there? Yeah, the VR is the, an interesting technology. It's been around a long time, actually. And it's great for gamers and things. And I think in the right settings, VR makes sense. You know, three, four years ago at, G at the NVIDIA's GPU technology conference, they rolled out a VR collaboration room called Holodeck, right after the Star Trek Holodeck. And I got the demo where I put a VR headset on, other people put it on, and we were in this virtual room and we were able to manipulate uh, a car that was there so we could take the car apart, we could move the parts around, we could change the color. In fact, there was a pen in which I could write in the air. So I could say, hey, David, tomorrow, can you please change this out into something else, right? And so the notes would stay in the air. Now, that's a very specific use case. I could see that in manufacturing. I could even see it in, like, in, in schools to do some immersive learning, right? As, but I, now I've also tried the demos where I put a VR headset on and I tried this, right? Just a see you, see me type of meeting where you looked a little more 3D. And frankly, the bulkiness of the headset, the my kind of lack of mobility of you know being able to move around a room or whatever, just didn't make the upside worth it to see David Dungy in 3D versus seeing him in 2D, right? So I think there is some work to be done there. If we are going to get to this 3D kind of telepresence or whatever you want to call it, I do think it would need to work the way that you see, like in Star Trek Discovery, where the person's almost beamed into you, you know, your room yeah. and you're not wearing anything special. So I, I think the, the VR model could work if you could port it down to something as small as glasses. Uh, and again, there's specific use cases. I could see doctors using it so they could maybe look up something while they're, you know, operating on a patient or something or look up x rays or something. But I think as a general collaboration tool, it's still really too bulky for it. And, and I, you know, you and I were talking before this about people who get motion sickness and things like that. That's very common with that. So I think there are a lot of use cases that it's good for, but I don't think it's ready for just everybody to use yet. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, we've, we've we've talked about AI. We've talked about VR. Um, we, again, we mentioned before we came on uh, the humble endpoint. Um, you're seeing a lot of in innovation around the endpoint uh, piece of UCAS right now. Uh, tell us what what are you seeing? Yeah, endpoint uh, endpoints have been. You know, everybody thinks the endpoint's dead, right? I think uh, uh, several years ago, Gartner even wrote a report saying the phone was dead, but people are still buying a lot of phones, right? And uh, But I think the variety of endpoints has changed. And so now we've got everything from high-end executive video systems all the way down to little cameras, personal systems, things like that. And and I do think that in a, um, in a return to work, uh, the choice of endpoint, people going back to the office, is going to be a big deal uh, because we are going to want to maintain a safe, off, uh, office space. We will want more voice activated endpoints. Um, uh, even, you know, being able to control them from your phone. Uh, I think touch screens are becoming bigger, but then you have to think about, you know, how you build them so they can be sanitized easily, things like that. So I do think there is more, a lot more innovation in the endpoint. If you look at a lot of the newer devices, the AI capabilities, virtual background, even facial recognition are, are built into the endpoint itself. I think one of the good things about endpoints today is things like speaker trap trap capability where i can watch a person move around a room or you know whatever uh that's gotten much easier to do and that's even been brought down to some low-end devices right um i i think i still think there's other you know there's other areas that need improving for instance i, I i'm still waiting for a camera with a light on right so sitting yeah. above me i've got a big light that shines on me and people are buying these little ring lights and things like that but it seems like a pretty obvious thing to build an endpoint, you know, a, a screen or a camera with a light in it. But, uh, you know, clearly there's a, there's a lot of room for innovation on the endpoint as you build in speech analytics, video analytics, 
uh, things like that. So, uh, you, you know, uh, if you're an organization and you're looking to redo a meeting room, I would certainly ask the vendor about what their roadmap is for a lot of these things to, to create a, a, um, a room that has uh, a lot of uh, pre-built safety built into it through the end. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, we're, we're in a fascinating time for, for UCAS at the moment. A lot of the big vendors are making humongous moves. You know, we're seeing Cisco releasing things, you know, at a, at a rate of knots around the WebEx piece. Uh, this week, we've got Microsoft Ignite going on, you know, rumors uh, surfaced recently about Zoom potentially acquiring the contact center space. Uh, you know, what, what's exciting you right now about, about the space? Uh, you know, what, what, are you, what are you focused on? Yeah, actually, I think I started that Zoom rumor. So I was talking to an equity analyst about that a few months ago. And then it, I got a call from another equity analyst saying, hey, do you really think? And I said, I never said that. I just said it would make sense for them to do that. But that seems to have taken a life of its own. Uh, I, I think um, what's been... Um, I think one of the exciting things to look at in the UCAS space is the the shift of these these um, solutions from product to platform. You know, uh, Vonage was one of the first to talk about being built on CPaaS. Avaya, you know, their Spaces product is built on CPaaS. Uh, you know, Cisco's new WebEx is, is built off a CPaaS like backend. Um, and what that does is it allows us, it allows us to stop thinking of these products as a standalone product, but allow us to create these composable applications where I can integrate the features into it. So if you think of like um, an educational uh, application or something a doctor might use or in the legal industry, right? Um, a lot of times these generic platforms don't work that well because it's hard to build a workflow around them and I still have to use other applications. So if I could actually just build video or build voice or build chat directly into the applications I already use, that allows me to be more productive. So you think of just even the way a doctor might work. Well, the doctor's going to be looking at the patient records and they may have their video platform up, but it's unlikely they're going to switch back and forth between the apps, right? And so um, if I could have everything built into one, you know, that into one application, I, it's funny because years and years ago, I wrote a report uh, that talked about how users don't want more apps. They just want more features built into the apps they already have. And it took us a long time to get to this point. But I think what we're starting to see is the platformization of all of these vendors. And it, this is an important thing to watch, Dave, because if you look at the software industry historically, any software company that's managed to become big, and I mean big, like Microsoft, Salesforce, SAP, they all have one thing in common is they became platforms. You look at other companies like a, like a Citrix, for instance, who look like they were tracking to big, but they never actually managed to make their product a platform, right? And you, you really wind up tapping out at around a billion, $2 billion in, so in revenue. Like, not that that's not big, but I'm talking like Microsoft big, right? So the, I think the, 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 the winners in this space are going to be the ones that are able to do that and, and enable other companies to do more on their products. And, you, you know, you, like I said, you saw Avaya make some announcements to see as Zoom come up with Zoom apps. Cisco's got their own store. So this is going to be a really fascinating area to watch moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Zeus, um, as always, it's always amazing to speak to you and uh, gather your insights on the market. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you. And uh, like I said, this is uh, uh, looking forward to more of these because uh, there's more stuff happening in UCAS today than I think uh, ever before in my career. Absolutely. Well, and thank you for watching. You've been watching me, David Dungay, on UC Today. If you like today's show, please give us a like and a share on social media. It's always appreciated. That's it for me. Until next time. Thank you.